We actually have a special guest here all the way from Ireland to talk about the political revolution that's taking place in Europe, Paul Murphy. Party in Ireland, the Socialist Party, and he was just re-elected as an anti-austerity alliance member of the Irish Parliament. His election to the Irish Parliament really serves as a lesson on the power of building movements inside and outside the halls of power. Over the past two years in Ireland, there's been a mass movement that's been developing and strengthening against the imposition of water charges, and Paul has been, as a member of the Socialist Party, a leader in the campaign to stop the water charges, advocating mass non-payment. And it was this mass movement against the water charges and the work that we've been doing in Ireland with the Socialist Party and our call for a mass boycott to defeat those water charges that propelled Paul to his first election victory in 2014 in the Irish Parliament. Since he was elected in 2014, he's used his position, just like our other members in the Irish Parliament in Ireland, to build and strengthen grassroots movements. And just to sort of give you a sense of how big this movement is in Ireland. On the same day that Paul was elected, uh, October 14th? No. October 11th, 2014. 100,000 people were marching in the streets against the water charges. And this was one of the largest demonstrations in Irish history. Now to give you a sense of the scale of that, than the United States. This would be the equivalent of 10 million people marching in the streets in the United States. So, quite a big movement. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Paul Murphy. Thanks a lot, Jess. Thanks very much for the invite to come and speak to you all. And this Easter has a very special significance for those of us in Ireland who are fighting for a political revolution. Uh, it marks a uh, hundred years since James Connolly, who was the outstanding socialist figure in Irish history, participated in what was called the Easter Rising, an armed uprising against British imperialism. Unfortunately, that writing proved to be premature. Uh, unfortunately, Connolly's Irish Citizen Army, which was based on the trade union movement, didn't issue its own socialist proclamation. But the reasons for Connolly and for all the people, ordinary people in the ICA and the Irish Volunteers, for participating in that reason were the very best reasons. They participated because they wanted to strike a blow against British imperialism, against the horrors of World War I, which was underway, and to try to, as Connolly wrote about when the war broke out, set the torch to a European conflagration that will not burn out until the last throne and the last capitalist bond and dementia will be shriveled on the funeral pyre of the last warlord. In, In simple terms, to spark a European-wide revolutionary movement against the war and against what Connolly called the barbaric ruling class responsible for that war. Connolly was executed uh, a few weeks after the rising. Uh, the very manner of his execution underlines the barbaric nature of the British ruling class. Uh, he was dying. He was a few days from dying in any case from being shot in the course of the rising. But nonetheless, they dragged him out of his prison cell, they tied him to a chair because he couldn't stand up, and they shot him in the chair. But Connolly's analysis, his assessment of the nature of the war, the nature of the capitalist system he was fighting against, was vindicated and has been vindicated ever since. His view of World War I, for example, as a war to divide the world between the major imperialist powers, was absolutely vindicated. About a month after the Easter Rising, 
a secret treaty was signed between the British and French governments called the Sykes-Picot Agreement to divide up the Middle East, uh, to divide and rule ordinary people in the Middle East, to secure access to natural resources for the British and French ruling classes, one of the consequences of which is the roots of conflict that we continue to see today in the Middle East. His vision of a European-wide conflagration, a Europe-wide uprising against the war and against the 1% of their day was premature, but it did anticipate what happened after the Russian Revolution in 1917, when you had similar mass movements, revolutionary movements developing in many different countries across Europe. And when you look at governments across the world today, when you look at them, how they still engage in brutal wars for oil and for profits, when you look at them sitting on their hands while we hurtle towards environmental catastrophe, when you look at them overseeing a system which is deepening poverty and inequality on a daily basis, you have to conclude there's still no better description than the description Connolly came up with for, for capitalist governments when he described them as committees of the rich to manage the affairs of the capitalist class. And that capitalist system that we still have today, the system of organizing society for profit, is in massive crisis. It's a massive crisis worldwide, and it has a particularly deep crisis across much of Europe. 2008 opened up the most significant period of crisis since that opened up by 1929, what's now known as the Great Recession. The world economy has still not recovered, in many countries, you still have high unemployment, extremely low growth rates, and yet, at the same time, they say the next crisis is on the horizon, with the stagnation in Europe and with the stock market crises in China. Within this period of crisis, I think we have seen a better than imaginable example of what Naomi Klein called the shock doctrine. The notion that the shock of a crisis caused by neoliberal capitalism would be used to further entrench that system. What we've seen is precisely disaster capitalism, using the disasters created by their system to wage an immense class war of the 1% against the rest, cutting back and privatizing public services, diminishing people's democratic rights, including their rights to protest, to organize, to effect change, and undermining and driving down workers' wages and conditions. And that's a global process. The result is the unprecedented level of inequality in the world, where for the first time ever, the top 1% own as much wealth as the whole rest of the world combined. In Europe, the crisis has been very deep. In particular, in the peripheral countries of Europe, the countries at the edge of Europe, Ireland, Spain, Greece, Portugal, Italy, the countries with historically weak economies, historically weak capitalist classes, the crisis has been particularly sharp. The, the example of Greece will just give you a picture of how bad it's been. I mean, in Greece, the economy collapsed by about a fifth. Public spending was cut by about a quarter. Wages for workers fell by about a third. Social safety nets, social welfare, pensions, etc., were effectively eliminated entirely. The result is if you visit Greece, a very visible humanitarian catastrophe. You know, massive off-the-charts increases in terms of the rates of suicide, of homelessness, of poverty, and of deprivation. And the same is echoed across much of Europe. But that class war, that attack by the 1% in Europe against the 99% has not been met by no response. It's been met by a very, very significant response by the 99%, by working people across Europe. Uh, in Greece, we've seen 30 general strikes throughout the course of the crisis, each one as heroic as the last. Workers who are suffering absolute poverty, taking a day without wages in order to fight back against the austerity, against the cutbacks and the extra taxation on working people. In Spain, we've seen... Spain, a whole series of workers' strikes, of general strikes, but above all, the Indignados movement, 
which was like the Occupy movement in the US, but on an even bigger scale, with hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people occupying all the key squares across Spain for a period of months. In Portugal, he had a movement called Screw the Troika, the Troika being the IMF, the European Central Bank, and the European Commission, a youth movement from below, which gave energy to the workers' movement, led to a general strike, a massive movement of mass radicalization. If you follow European politics and the economy, you'd know that Ireland is meant to be different. Ireland is meant to be the great success story of austerity. The one place that austerity worked, that is used as a stick to beat the people of Greece, of Spain, of Portugal and other countries in Europe with. The reality was very, very different. You had the biggest bank aid bailout in the world. It's a world record that Irish people hold. Every single person in Ireland no matter what age they are, effectively, collectively owes for each person $20,000 for the biggest bank bailout in the world. The anger at the bank bailout and the cutbacks, the massive cuts in state spending to pay for that bank bailout resulted in you know, growing, growing anger that then exploded in the mass movement that Jess referred to that developed at the end of 2014. And the result was spontaneous organization from below a new ways of organizing using social media, but also using street meetings, hundreds of street meetings happening in communities right across the country. Repeated demonstrations of 100,000 plus right across the country uh, taking place. And most importantly, a mass boycott of the water charges. We're now over a year after the water charges being introduced. We have daily propaganda, we have daily ads from Irish water. We have daily scaremongering, threats of court action, and still over 50% of people refuse to pay their water charges. <laughs> but the economic crisis, it's been so deep, it's been so protracted, that it's also caused a massive political crisis for the 1% right across the continent. Just like in America, uh, political landscapes in Europe have generally been dominated by two parties. In Europe, mostly that's one openly right-wing conservative party and another that is a formerly social democratic party that is now practically indistinguishable from the openly conservative party. And between them, in Greece, in Spain, in Italy, right across the continent, those parties generally commanded 70, 80, 90% plus of the vote. That two-party system, like in America, is an essential safety valve for the capitalist system. It means that people can get angry and annoyed at one party in power and then can vote for the safe alternative of the other party and can simply rinse and repeat over the years. But that safety valve has been broken under the impact and the length of the crisis and the movements because both parties have been in power and both parties have implemented exactly the same measures of austerity. And the result is that now in Ireland, in Spain, and in Greece, in the most recent elections, the combined two biggest parties historically, that historically would have been 70, 80, 90 percent plus, in all those countries, they dropped to below 50 percent in the most recent elections. <laughs> to give a picture of what that means, in Ireland, for example, we had an election a month ago. We still have no government, which is why I can be here, that's a, an upside. Um, and the most likely government that will be formed will be a never-before-seen coalition of Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael, the two historic big parties of Irish capitalism, where they'll agree to rotate the Prime Minister between us. It's the equivalent in America of the Republicans and the Democrats agreeing to share the presidency, to do two years each of a four-year term. It's literally the same. It shows them a massive political crisis for their system that it is. And so they have a crisis on the one hand, on the other hand, in that political vacuum is the emergence of new left forces. The search of the 99% to build political weapons to represent their interests and to fight backward. In Greece, you saw the rise of Syriza from 4% in 2009 to 36% in 2015. In Spain, Podemos stood for the first time in a general election a few months ago and received over 20% of the vote. In Portugal, the left parties received 18% in the most recent elections, and in Britain, 
the outlines of a new party has taken shape within the Labour Party, with the election of Socialist Jeremy Corbyn as Labour leader against the Whigs. In Ireland, the newly formed bloc of the Anti-Austerity Alliance and People for Profit, which the Socialist Party is a part of, elected six members of Parliament in the most recent elections, an historic high in terms of genuine socialists being elected, and only one behind what the Labour Party, which was founded by James Connolly, but then betrayed everything that he stood for, what they received. These movements are such that if they develop further, in a whole number of countries, they can seriously challenge for power, for left governments and for mass movements from below to end the rule of the 1%. But we also can learn lessons from what's already happened in Europe, to know that we are up against a 1% that is immensely powerful. They own and control the media. They own and control the establishment party politicians. And they own and control the economy. And every weapon that they have, every source of power that they have, will be used against us to prevent any fundamental change taking place. In America, you have Fox News. We laugh at Fox News around the world as the most blatantly right-wing propaganda ever. In Ireland, our equivalent is ironically titled Independent News and Media, owned by one of the richest men in Ireland. This is the paper that in 1916 called for the execution of James Connolly. And today they devote much space to ridiculing the anti-austerity alliance and attacking the anti-water charges movements. But just like in America, they're just the most blatant. The others serve the same corporate interests. And so another non-independent news and media ran one of the more incredible stories, which was a picture of Ruth Coppinger, one of our other uh, members of parliament than myself, on the front page with a massive headline saying, Democrats who believe in mob rule. The 1%, they also have the state. They have the police, the courts, the prisons to try to stop us. Yeah. And again, we have watched in America the militarization of your cities to try to clamp down on the Black Lives Matter movement. In Ireland, They've blocked, refused to give a permit to allow the Anti-Austerity Alliance to raise funds. They have engaged in extensive spying operations against Anti-Austerity Alliance and water charges activists. And they're currently trying to imprison me and over 20 other people for long prison sentences for the charge of false imprisonment because we sat down behind the Deputy Prime Minister's car. Literally. Above all though, they use their ownership and control of the economy to try to stop any fundamental change. In Greece, Syriza was elected. I was there in January 2015 when they were elected on a program of reversing austerity. They gave hopes to people right across Europe that there could be an alternative, that the wall that says there is no alternative was breached by the election of a left government. But within 200 days, despite an exception taking on the Clintons of his time, whoever the equivalent was. And he, he quotes them dismissively, and you could, you could hear them today. He quotes them saying, let, let us be practical. We want something pr pr practical. Connolly responds, in the phraseology of politics, a party too indifferent to the sorrow and sufferings of humanity to raise its voice in protest is a moderate, practical party. Whilst a party totally indifferent to the personality of leaders or questions of leadership, but hot to enthusiasm on every question affecting the well-being of the toiling masses is an extreme, a dangerous party. Yet although it may seem a paradox to say so, there is no party so incapable of achieving practical results as an orthodox political party. And there is no party so certain of placing moderate reforms to its credit as an extreme, a revolutionary party. You look at the fight for 15, here, you look at hopefully the victory against the water charges in Ireland, it's a great example. Connolly again. Moral, don't be practical in politics. To be practical in that sense means that you have schooled yourself to think along the lines and in the grooves those who rob you would desire you to think. Every public question is a political question. The men who tell us that Labour questions, for instance, have nothing to do with politics, understand neither the one nor the other. The Labour question cannot be settled 
except by measures which necessitate a revision of the whole system of society, which of course implies political warfare to secure the power to effect such revision. To effect its emancipation, labour must reorganise society on the basis of labour. This cannot be done while the forces of government are in the hands of the rich, therefore the governing power must be wrested from the hands of the rich. Revolution is never practical until the hour of the revolution strikes. Then it alone is practical, and all the efforts of the conservatives and compromisers become the most futile and visionary of human imaginings. For that hour let us work, think and hope. For that hour let us pawn our present ease in hopes of a glorious redemption. For that hour let us prepare the hosts of labour with intelligence sufficient, sufficient to laugh at the nostrums dug practical by our slave lords, practical for the perpetuation of our slavery. For that supreme crisis of human history, let us watch, like sentinels, with weapons ever ready, remembering always that there can be no dignity in labour until labour knows no master. Thank you very much.